although it is a new chapter, we don't have an entirely new thought. The end of chapter 11, we find Paul worshiping the Lord and giving glory to the Father. And that stimulates or brings us right into chapter number 12, which we talked about last Sunday, is all about how to serve God. And in verse number one, it says, I beseech you. This is not Paul commanding like Moses. This is beseeching. You see Moses' commands all through Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers and all of that. But here, Paul writes, I beseech you. And we even see in Philemon, he say, he, Paul writes, for love's sake, I rather beseech thee. It's out of love that he's beseeching us through the Holy Spirit's inspiration, and it's out of love of why we're going to serve our great God. He even writes in 2 Corinthians, I beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Look, this isn't, you have to do this. This is an honest, earnest beseechment. Think about God's mercies and his, and his gentleness and his meekness. And because of that, you'll love him enough to, to just want to serve him. I beseech you therefore, brethren, this is for Christians. We already know now through the book of Romans uh, chapters one through eight, we already know what it means to be saved. I trust that you are saved. Amen. If you're not, this isn't for you. You're not a brethren or a sister. <laughs> this is for God's people. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of of God. He's starting off where he left off, the strength of God's mercies. Flip back a page. Look at verse 30 in Romans 11. It says at the end, yet have now obtained mercy. Look at verse 31, the end of it, that through your mercy, they also may obtain mercy. Look at verse 32, that he might have what? mercy upon all. Look at verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. At the end of it, to whom be glory forever. The last, last few words of chapter 11. And then it gets on to verse number one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Oh, it's a new chapter, but it's not an entirely new thought. The one thought builds upon the other. Worshiping God, and now we're getting into service. And then it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies. You, you, you present, this is a temple term. This is something that you're going to bring to God. You're going to present your body. Go to Luke chapter number two, and I'll show you something here. By way of remembrance, look at Luke two. Luke chapter number two. This was in obedience to Exodus 13, back in the law uh, that we talked about, Moses' commanding. But this is a uh, Luke, 20, Luke 2, verse 21. Watch what it says. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him, that be Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And I want you to just think about that. That was in obedience to Exodus 13 too. But Jesus was presented at the temple to the Lord are you saved? Do you have Christ living in you? Amen. God says, show up. Present yourself as a living sacrifice. Present yourself. Colossians chapter number one. I'll show you another one that I think you'll find beneficial to this thought. Colossians chapter one. Watch what the Bible says in verse number 28. Paul says this under the Holy Spirit's inspiration and by means of the gospel, here's what he says. Whom we preach, this is Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory, 
whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Are you a believer? If you are, Christ is in you. And you, each believer, Paul is saying, I want to present each believer for the service of the Lord. (laughs) You have Christ living in you. Present yourself. And that desire is in Paul's heart. We we see that in Colossians 1 and, and, and and, and Romans chapter 12. Go back to Romans 12 and we can read this verse. And I'm telling you, if you're like me, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, if you're like me, you can probably feel a little bit condemning of yourself because we haven't, well, because we've neglected this verse last year (laughs) or last month or last week or yesterday. Are there times in your past where you feel like, you know what? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies and you think, you know what? I haven't really done all I should have done for you, Lord. Have you felt? I felt like that. We shouldn't read this verse condemning ourselves, nor should we read this verse in the present thinking, oh, I'm going to be forced to now do this. Neither are true. We already learned in Romans 8, you're not condemned in Christ. So we need to stop it with the condemning stuff of ourselves. Neither are we forced to presently do what Paul is beseeching us to do. And we're going to find out why as we go through the chapter. But basically it's this. It's through the power of God's mercy, which we just saw this thought. You're presenting your bodies by the mercies of God. He's taking that thought, tying it right back to Romans chapter number 11. And he's saying, look, have you been justified? Are you now identified in Christ? You don't have the death of Adam. You have the life of Christ. Did you just learn in chapter 8 that now you have the indwelling Holy Spirit that you can yield to? Isn't my mercy good enough to motivate you to live for me? That's what God's saying. He doesn't and shouldn't have to force any of us to do anything. Are you the elect of God? And do you know for sure that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ? Do we learn that in Romans 8? Shouldn't we just get on our knees and thank God for his mercies? And that's the fuel that motivates us. I'm here, Lord. I'm ready to present myself. No matter what the past is, right now I'm here. I want to present myself as a living sacrifice. You can do it. I can do it. We all can. And notice it says a living sacrifice. There's no need anymore for dead sacrifices. And we have all that we need in Christ right now. We are alive from the dead. In Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. We don't need to add this verse to our justification that we just talked about. What Paul is trying to get us to see is the benefit package, the bonuses, if you will, that we didn't know that we had when we got saved. You don't add this on to your justification. It's part of what you got when you got justified. Your body can now be presented to God. And Paul wants you to understand this. And you're not, so many of us think we aren't presenting ourselves to God thinking of who we were in the past. I thought all those sins were paid for. Why would you do that? Why would you present yourself to God with your motive and mindset, well, I couldn't do that because of, are you saved? (laughs) Are you washed in the blood? 
Do you think God's lying when he said, look, he redeemed you, he justified you, he sanctified you. Just present yourself as you are because as you are now is in Christ. And praise the Lord for it. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter number five, and let's look at verse number 15. Second Corinthians five, verse number 15. And the Bible says then that he died, that's Christ, for all. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, you see that in 2 Corinthians 5? In verse number 15, he says, look, I want you to live, but I don't want you to live. I want you to live, but I don't want you to live unto yourself because how you lived unto yourself was how you and I lived before we came to Christ. It was all about living for self. So then he goes on to say, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Christ wants you to live for Him. Amen. And if He doesn't want you to live as you lived before for yourself, that means what's going to have to die? Self. Self has to die every day. Because if it doesn't, you're going to live unto self. And God says, I want you to live, but not like that. How you live and how I live matters to God. And it's very important to Him and it should be important <laughs> to us. And we have taken salvation, not we individuals here, but cultural Christianity at large has taken salvation to just be assent to these facts, nod your head yes, and salvation is way out there in eternity. And it is out there in eternity. But it's also presently here now. Now. And every time an appeal comes to a Christian to live differently, to live sacrificially, the cry from the balcony shouldn't be, well, that's legalistic. Or, we're under grace. We can do whatever we want. No. God is beseeching us. And he clearly told us in 2 Corinthians 5, I want you to live, but not like that, like this. And you know what that is? Reasonable. For all of us, it's reasonable service. Amen. When you hear the word sacrifice, probably you're probably like me, you think of death. Sacrifice is a term related to death. We think of the Old Testament animal sacrifices. Those animals lost their life. We think of Christ as what type of sacrifice? A substitutionary sacrifice for us. He died. He gave up his life. His body was slain on the tree. We think of it as death. And it is about death, except it's not about death in this verse. It's about a sacrificial life. It's about living. You live with sacrifice in mind. And it's not only with the view of eternity. It's in view of my life now in view of eternity. Life now can be lived for Him. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, right? Not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. God wants you to live for Him. Amen. When you think about Abraham offering up his son Isaac, the first thought that comes to our minds is a typology, a picture of God the Father offering God the Son for a substitutionary sacrifice for us, right? And absolutely we should. But you know what Abraham was also called? 
the friend of God. And you think about what Abraham, he was so near to God, he was so dedicated to God. And he's taking that trek up Mount Moriah. And he's got to be thinking in his mind, the promised blessing from my seed, Isaac, I'm going to give that up, God. He was the friend of God. Abraham, his personal desire, his personal ambition, the personal hold that he had on the promise of God, he's taken that trip up the Mount Moriah, and that's all aside. All he knows is he's obeying God. He's happy to present his son and himself, that sacrifice. He's happy to do it. You know what the call is? It's not just God the Father as a typology and God the Son as a typology and a sacrificial death. But you know what else is also there in Abraham and Isaac? It's a sacrificial life. I am willing to take this walk. I am willing to go there because I want to live for you, God. Have you thought about that? It's just easier for us to say, you know what? I just got rid of this sin in my life and I got rid of this evil in my home and praise the Lord, I got rid of some bad stuff that I knew was sin in my life. Have you done that? I've done that. Have you done it? Isn't it easier to do that and say that than to say, you know what, God? There's some stuff in my life that isn't sinful, but I'm just not willing to give it up because I'd rather not take that walk. <laughs> God wants you to present yourself a living sacrifice to do good for him. Get rid of the evil. Get rid of the sin. But what are you going to replace it with? Are you going to walk? Are you going... <laughs> Are you going to put self to death? Are you going to put your personal ambition to death? Are you going to surrender your personal desire for God? And rather than walk up Mount Moriah, most of us would rather just walk up Mount Miriah. <laughs> That's me. I'm going to walk up the mountain of me, Lord. <laughs> Personal ambition. You have a desire to be personally successful. I'm asking you to check that with the Lord. Because He wants you to present yourself not to yourself, He wants you to present yourself to Him and say, Lord, I'll walk the walk you would have me to walk. I will give up something personally. He's willing to give up his son. He's willing to give up the promise of the seed in his son. How about that? How about that? Where are you at this morning with that? And I'm just telling you, this world doesn't want you to live for God. And when your kids are young, parents, Grandparents can probably relate to this. When your kids are young, uh, part of this world might think it's cute. Oh, you dress your daughter in dresses. Isn't that cute? Oh, you homeschool and you use the McGuffey readers. Isn't it just like the little house on the prairie? Oh, you do some farming. We're not a nostalgic TV show. <laughs> okay, no, my wife's name isn't Laura and middle name Engels. We're Christians. We live for God. We sacrifice our lives for God. We want to present ourselves as living sacrifices for Him. Amen. We're not trying to live some cute little fanciful life. There's nothing cute about it. It's for God the Savior. Yes, sir. I'm telling you, those kids grow up. They're not going to want that for your kid. They're, they're going to want your daughter out of dresses and they want to put her, they'll want to put her in some lumberjack britches. They'll be happy about that. This world will be happy for when your son to grow up, he paints, paints his, uh, his nails blue 
and starts cross-dressing. That's what that world wants. They want to see your children and your grandchildren go the way of the world. They might think it's cute when they're young, but they can't wait to get their paws on them. They want your kids walking the way of the world. And I'm standing between them. And if you're a Christian that wants to live for God, you stand between them. And you don't let them get to your kids. You don't let them get to my kids. You don't let them get to our kids. You don't let them get to our church. Now, that's a little bit of preaching on a Sunday morning. I hope that's okay. We're at church. Amen. Amen. God wants us to live for Him. And He doesn't want the world to stop us. And the world shouldn't stop us. And they want your kids out of church. Oh, isn't that cute? They bring their kids to church every Sunday. Except when they're older, they can't wait to get them out of church. You know how it's going to start? I've got an extracurricular activity for you on Thursday night, young man. You're 16, you're 17, you're old enough to not listen to that anymore. Why don't you come on by on Thursday night? We're going to have a little volleyball practice. And then all of a sudden, yeah, Mom, Dad, I, I'm not sure if I want to go. Midweek ain't really that, sir. I mean, we're in the, we're in the Bible's midweek service anyway. <laughs> Oh, you're right, it isn't. Have fun at volleyball. That's what the world wants. And you know what the church wants? The carnal, the carnival church? The guy that has pretzels the clown behind the pulpit instead of a Bible-believing preacher? You know what he wants? He can't wait to give your older teenage son a sermon on legalism. Because he don't want to live for God, and so he don't want your kids to live for God. And then before you know it, Faithful attendance to church is gone. You might as well forget about doing any type of evangelism. That's been gone long ago. That, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom, but that's the reality of what this world wants for our young people. God wants us to present our bodies a living sacrifice for His service. And there's something for everybody to do. And I want you to pick something and God can use you. Amen. This Christian life is one of death and resurrection. And some of the things that we might like to do, they're not evil. But God says, you know what? If you're a Christian, I didn't lay you aside so you can become a basketball champion. I didn't lay you aside so you can be a karate champion. I didn't lay you aside so you can be some big Broadway actor. God said, I laid you aside for my service. Amen. Well, can I be used for your service if I'm a famous uh, uh, athlete and I play sports on Sunday and everybody sees me with John 3.16 on my jersey? No. No. Not as much as you could have been if you said, you know what, I'm a Christian, I'm going to church, I'm not shooting a basketball. Amen. How's that? Is that okay to say? Yeah. Because we've got our sports gods, we have no uh, problem serving. I'm here, coach. Got my new cleats on. They got the new spikes like you told me to, bought, to buy. My sneakers are $200. Oh, that's funny. When the preacher asked you to give the missions, you didn't have 200 bucks, but Monday morning came around and you're at Academy Sports buying cleats. <laughs> right? Okay. Are you saying baseball is wrong? What I'm saying is spending all your money on that and not on the Lord is wrong. You presented yourself to the world, but you won't present yourself to God. And God said, I, don't want, I want you to live, but not that way, this way. And if you can't do both, just pick God. Right. I had to make a choice in my life. You have to make a choice in your life. I could have went down the road of continual personal ambition and personal success and doubled my wealth, doubled my income, just like you can. But I couldn't get away from the call of God on my life and I had to make some decisions. 
And it wasn't about getting rid of sin in my life. It was about getting rid of good things that are productive to society and can help people to say, you know what, Lord, just set me apart for you. You're going to have to make that decision for your life. I'm going to have to continue to make that decision for my life. And no parent wants their kids to go the way of the world. But if they decide to go the way of the world, that doesn't mean you follow them. You got to walk Mount Moriah. You don't walk Mount Me Moriah. Amen. Mount Me Moriah. <laughs> and you'd be surprised. God will put circumstances in your life that will prevent you from accomplishing all the things that you want to accomplish so that He can set you aside so you can live a sacrificial life for Him. He don't want you to die like a martyr. All He wants you to do is live a life sacrificially for Him. Alright, Romans 12. Next part of verse number 1. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1 says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. I'd like everybody to say that word with me. Holy. Uh, that means not unholy, okay? It also means we're not holy hermits. God doesn't want us hidden in isolation in some mountain somewhere, uh, uh, you know, out in the Rockies. <laughs> he wants us to live a clean, holy, pure life, and He says this is reasonable. And you wouldn't dare thinking of offering an unholy sacrifice to God. Go to Leviticus chapter number 1 if you would. And let's get Hebrews 3. Leviticus 1, Hebrews chapter 3. Leviticus chapter number 1, look at verse number 3. Bible says, If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without what? Blemish. Those Old Testament priests wouldn't have thought about bringing a blemished, unholy, sacrificial lamb. They wouldn't have thought of it. Uh, go to Leviticus chapter number 3 and look at verse number 1. And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without what? Blemish. Blemish. Why? Because it's before the who? Lord. We would never get allowed. We, we read our Old Testament. We would have never allowed those priests to get away with anything other than that. Because we know that. We know that. Go to Deuteronomy 15. Deuteronomy 15. Verse number 21. Deuteronomy 15, verse 21. The Bible says, And if there be any blemish therein, as if it be lame or blind or have any ill blemish, thou shalt not sacrifice it unto the Lord. You see that? You would not sacrifice that lamb. God is not saying if, you're, if, if you have a lame leg or your one eye doesn't work that you can't be used of God. That is not the application I'm making out of Deuteronomy. The application I'm making is your life spiritually it better not be lame or blind. And some of us may have some blind spots. Too much time doing things that aren't sinful because we justify in our mind, well, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, but how much time did you set apart for the Lord? It's a holy life. Young people, pay attention to me. Young ladies, especially, you listen up. I don't care how tough the guy looks. The muscles are going to go away. Okay? I don't care how successful he is and how much starch he has in his collar where he looks like a real, real business executive. The money's going to go away. Here's what I want to know. Is he living a holy life? Holy Young men, 
I don't care how good she looks. I don't care how much uh, lipstick or chapstick or whatever she's putting on her face to make herself look good. The looks go away. Okay? I don't care how many smooth words you hear. Here's what I want to know. Is she living a holy life? Does she go to church? Well, in December on the 25th, any time else? Well, sometimes in March or April, depending on the... So she goes to church twice a week and you think she's living a holy life? What is she doing with the rest of her time? What is he doing with the rest of his time? Oh, just some stuff. He's not holy. She's not holy. They're doing some stuff. It's all about them and what their mind desires. You want somebody who is willing and wanting to live a holy life. A good place to start would be to meet somebody at church. <laughs> That's a good place to start rather than meeting somebody at the bar or meeting somebody at the ball game. Well, they share all of the same things as me. Yeah, but they worship the God of Chemosh. <laughs> I don't care if they love baseball like you love baseball. They worship another God. Yeah, you know, but it's, he's willing to listen to some things. Get rid of him. He ain't holy and she ain't holy. God wants us living holy lives. Hebrews 3. Bible says in Hebrews 3, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. If you're saved, that's your calling and that's your standing. Holiness. Hebrews 10. Look at verse 10. Hebrews 10.10. 10. Bible says, by the which will we are sanctified. You know what sanctified means. Set apart and made what? Holy. You. By the which will we, that's us, brethren, are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Praise the Lord. Amen. And then it says in Romans 12, not only should we live a holy life, but one that is acceptable to God. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse number 6. Ephesians 1. The Bible says in verse number 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, Ephesians 1, 6, wherein He, that be God, hath made us, that be Usins and Ewins accepted in the beloved and in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace why would you want to live your life to please anybody else other than God and if your wife is holy and if your husband is holy and if your child is holy, nobody's going to have a problem with each one wanting to please God. Because if we're all pleasing God, everybody's happy. We are accepted in the beloved. Please Him. You're accepted by God. Your, your life of sacrificial living, God accepts that. If you want to be accepted in the sports world, you have got to be a producer. You got to do good. Or you're not accepted. We want the team to win. You better practice up and get good. You're going to have to buy all the clothes. You're going to have to learn all of the language. 
steal first base or steal second base. Well, wait, I thought we're not supposed to steal. No, you don't take it off the field. It means you run to that base and you try to get ahead. You got to learn the language, okay? Every every sport, every every industry has a language. You got to learn all that to be accepted. Folks, we're already accepted in Christ. We're accepted in Him. There's nothing else we have to do or prove or earn. God says, in me, you're accepted. Now just present yourself and live for me. I'll live through you. That's what He wants. And God says it's reasonable. Live a life that's holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I want you to look at 1 Peter. And go to chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter number 2. Keep your finger, uh, or get, get Hebrews 13, flip back a page and get Hebrews 13 too, so we can get both of them. We'll do 1 Peter 2, but also have Hebrews 13. So far, everything we've talked about is completely reasonable for us to do. Uh, God calls it reasonable service. 1 Peter 2. Look at verse 5. Bible says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Uh, chapter 2, I'm sorry. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. We there? I'm there. Sorry to confuse you. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. Ye also as lively stones. Well, I thought stones are dead. Not you, not me. We are a stone that is alive. 1 Peter 2, chapter number 5 also says, are built up and a spiritual house. You're a spiritual stone dwelling in a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up what type of sacrifices? Spiritual. And those spiritual sacrifices aren't dead animals. It's your body. And it's alive. And 1 Peter 2 verse 5 says, that is acceptable to God because of you? No. By Jesus Christ. Because Romans 12 is all about living for Him as His righteousness works through you. And that's how we live. Last, Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Those Old Testament sacrifices found their fulfillment in the once for all sacrifice in Hebrews. We understand that because of one sacrifice, because of that one, we now, go to Hebrews 13, we now can do this. Hebrews 13, watch this, verse number 15. By Him therefore, let us offer the sacrifices of praise to God continually. How can we do that? Because of the one-time sacrifice, we can now offer up this praise to God continually. That's what it means to praise God. That's what it means to be acceptable to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. And then it says, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased to do good. That's our service. We have a lot of trees on our property. A lot. And every now and then, if a big, big pine tree, they get uprooted. Oaks really don't. You, but if you knock them down, you get land cleared. And you get somebody knock a big oak tree down. Or if a big pine tree gets uprooted, man, it's like a crevice is left in the ground. And you walk by and you say, wow, that tree isn't there. I sure do miss that tree. And you can look down and you can be reminded on how ginormous it was and how much, how much 
reach it had. You know, when you look, you see those other branches from the other trees, they haven't yet filled in where that one big tree has been taken down. And you can even look into that crevice and you can see, wow, look at the massive roots on that. And you can look in there and see, man, those roots must have gone out so deep. Man, you missed that tree. You missed that tree. You drive by, you walk through your property. Hey, you remember that big tree? Remember how big that crevice was? You know what else we have on our property? Little saplings. You just pull those up like nothing. Then you walk by and it's like, you don't remember it. You're not even thinking about it. <laughs> You're just stepping over the ground. There's no big hole. There's, there isn't a big void in the forest where other branches have to come and take up that space. None of that's there. It's just a sapling. It made no dent in the forest at all. What are you and what am I? Have we offered up to God our reasonable service, a holy life that's acceptable unto Him? If you were rooted up, would it be a big crevice in the ground or would it be like, you know what, didn't do nothing anyway? I never offered up my lips to praise to God. Romans 12 was about our sacrificial life for Him. If you get rooted up, if I get rooted up, man, there should be a void there. They're not here anymore. Man, it's going to take a long time for some, for some other branches to grow to fill that void. It's going to take some lo a long time. Man, look how deep their roots went. You remember how much good they did. You know how much they served God. It's going to take some time for that hole to be filled. Or are we just a sapling? God wants us to show up and present ourselves and say, you know what? Live for me. Make a dent in this world for me. When you're gone, make enough a dent in this world where it's going to take some time for someone to fill your spot. Whatever that spot is, everybody has a spot. God just says, present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto me. It's your reasonable service. Just present yourself. God will make the way for you to live more fully for Him. You just got to be willing to make the trek up Mount Moriah and get off Mount Moriah and be willing to sacrificially live for God.